It's the How to Write Funny podcast. I'm Scott Dickers, speaking today with Bob Einstein, writer, producer, occasional comic actor, who's had a nearly 50-year career in comedy, perhaps best known as Super Dave Osborne. Bob, give us a sense of your first job in comedy, which I believe was the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. Is that correct? Yes. Contextually, at that time, what was that show? Can you compare it to anything today? No. Um, because we were all kids. We were young kids. Uh, Tom Smothers had hired us to do the, um, the Glenn Campbell show, which was the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. And it, was, it was the formation of Glenn's show. And uh, that's where we started, and then we all moved over to the Smothers Brothers. And, and we broke new ground, and we were the only show really bringing in a young audience. And uh, we were so hot, we beat Bonanza. We went up against Bonanza and beat Bonanza, which was a very strong show in those days. Huge show. Yeah, we got picked up for 26 shows. I mean, we were on fire. And then got canceled after we were picked up. So of course, it was it was a very strange time because it was it was it was a complete high for all of us, and then a very strange. What are we doing? How can you take this off the air? They've never done this before. There's no reason for it. So it was hard to understand, and and and. But we, it, Tommy Smothers is the reason for. If any of us, uh, Steve Martin and myself and a lot of people, for their success, if not for him, we don't have that success. Yeah, I mean, TV was such a conservative medium, and the audience was conservative not, adults. Not only, like. not only conservative, but it was very small. It was only three networks. Right. So your chance of selling something or making something work, you were very limited. And uh, there was no room for a Kardashian show. There was no room for uh, the naked dating. There's no room for uh, the, the bats. There's no room for that stuff. And Tommy had sold. He, he had his show and the right to sell an hour replacement, which he did with Glenn Campbell. And then he had two shows and two hour replacements and got canceled. So he 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 just for a very I'm, I'm, not, I'm still not positive of the reason, but they took him off the air and just kind of destroyed his life in a way. They were scared, weren't they? Because they either had conservative programming for adults or they had kitty programming. They had what no, no counterculture is, programming. What happened is the White House intervened. And when the White House intervenes with the head of CBS, it becomes kind of a shock. And this was because they were against the Vietnam War and they were scared exactly. of that. Exactly. And we were the only ones saying it. And we were doing comedy with it. And, uh, you know, they took things out of our show. Harry Belafonte, who at the time was like a god, did a song called Don't Stop the Carnival. And in the background, it was the riots in Chicago. And they didn't let that air. I mean, if you saw what we did now, you wouldn't believe that we were canceled. Yeah, it's sad. And, and you mentioned uh, Tommy Smothers was pretty destroyed by that. What happened to him after the show? We went on and we tried to do another Smothers Brothers show on ABC, but, but you can't do it again. Were they also scared, or did it was the magic No, just no, no, no. They weren't scared, because... I think Tommy felt that, that we were so hot that something would happen. I mean, it was just, it was hard to, to put your arms around it because you don't understand any of it. You know, this is something that had never happened. And, um, you know, it turns out that, the, to me, the Vietnam War, War may be one of the great tragedies in our existence. And... Um, I'm not going to say we were right or wrong, but we shouldn't have been taken off the air. We're yeah. doing comedy. That's what we were doing was comedy. We're not standing up and making a, you know. A statement? Yeah, no, no. I mean, we were, that, was, that isn't what we were trying to do. We were trying to be funny. And we did everything in front of a live audience. And if they didn't laugh, you know, that's the way it was. Well, I think when good people do really good comedy, sometimes they start doing 
satirical comedy, and that's when you start making a statement, and it's subversive, and people don't like that, obviously. Yeah. But you know what? They have the, certainly have the choice to not watch it. Well, if there's only three networks, maybe they don't. No, because a lot of shows didn't make it. I mean, we, we, were, we were the opposite of not being watched. I mean, we were red hot. You couldn't get in to see our show. You could, we got any guests we wanted. And, and I'm telling you, we were the only show that really... I mean, Laugh-In had a great audience, but we had a young audience. Well, in a way, you foretold the coming boom of baby boomer entertainment, especially in comedy, the explosion of the 70s and 80s and SNL and everything that came from it. You guys were kind of the first really counterculture targeted show. Yes. And that was pretty big. So since media was so small, the, the, the pickings were so slim, what kind of comedy did you and the other writers on that show grow up liking? Was there anything similar that that inspired you or that you liked um i grew up i i i loved martin and lewis they they would host the colgate comedy hour as a kid i loved that i loved laurel and hardy um and i and i can't i just loved it if something made me laugh, I loved it. That's all I can say. I mean, I, I, I love Laurel and Hardy, I guess, and maybe Martin and Lewis because of the relationship. I love the fact in Laurel and Hardy that, that he completely destroyed Hardy, and yet the next day they were there. They were together. They were, you know, they loved each other. So that, that was kind of a, a complete story. I loved that. That's great, and you replicated that, I would say, in your Super Dave Osborne work. Well, that's a, that's a nice thing to say. But because you were totally destroyed every time, and yet uh, you and your team were back for another that stunt. That's true. I, I didn't really think of that, but we did. Fuji and Mike and I were always there. <laughs> right. So, besides the, those early TV shows, was there anything, like, your friends, uh, did you guys do comedy, uh, your family, I know your father worked in comedy, is that right? Yes, my dad was a brilliant uh, radio comedian, and he went under the name of Park Your Carcass, which is, uh, he was a Greek restaurant owner, and um, he worked with the greats. Was he on, like, a radio sitcom, or what did he do, variety oh, no, shows? no, he had his own show. First of all, he was with Eddie Cantor for years. He worked with Al Jolson, and then he got his own show, Meet Me at Parkies, which was a big hit. And um, he, then he, he went to the Beverly Hilton when he was 54 years old and got up at a Lucille Ball Desiarnes uh, roast, just killed the audience, sat down and died of a heart attack. Oh, my God. What year was that? It was in 1957. Wow. So you are a pretty young kid at that point. I was young. It was, it was just impossible. Wow. How old were you? I believe I was 14 and a half. Oh, yeah. That's rough. Yeah. So it's you and your mom, and how many brothers or sisters do you have? Two brothers. Two and a half brothers. Two and a half. Two brothers. Yeah, I had a half brother, Charlie, who was oh. a great writer. And so I'm guessing that must have been. Were you guys funny as a family before your father died? Like just funny at the dinner table? Yeah, at the dinner table we were funny. My mom left the table many times. Oh, she couldn't stand it. No, and my mom was a brilliant singer and an actress and a great woman. We loved her. But there was no feeling of show business in the family because it just wasn't that way in those days. The idea of a showbiz career was not realistic, even though your father was in it? Um, no, I, I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, that we didn't walk around like a show business family. Like, right. Because we just didn't. Right, you're just we were brought up. having fun as a family. Yes, yes making people laugh and always making people laugh that that's something that i didn't realize growing up but but kids that do that now they ought to pursue it because 
basically, and when I think back about it without getting too boring, um, you're trying things out. You don't realize it, but when you make people laugh, you're trying things out. You're experimenting with your own comedy. You don't realize it because you're a kid. I mean, if you do realize it, you're probably pretty obnoxious, but if, you, if you're just trying to make people laugh and trying to make funny of the moment, you're basically experimenting. Yeah, you're learning what works, what doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. And so is there any competition between you and... Uh, now, does your half-brother live with uh, you and... No, my half-brother passed away. His name was Charlie, and he was a writer. He, he, he was a sports writer and a writer, and he... He did all the Willie Mays books and everything. Okay. It was terrific. But he didn't live with you in the house growing no, up? No, no, no. Okay. Um, was there competition between you and uh, Albert? You're, a lot of people may not know Albert Brooks is your brother. No, we were kids, you know. But what I mean is like comedy competition, like trying to one-up each other in jokes and stuff like that. Um, I don't remember that. Did you work no. on projects together, like funny no. cassette tape? projects no, or stories no, no I, I was yeah. mainly growing up I, I loved sports I played basketball and the way I got into the business was really weird it was really strange it's kind of I, by accident well, right totally I, I I was working at an advertising agency and and this guy Bob Arbogast who had a big radio show and a one a week television show I used to use him as voiceovers all the time and I told him one day, I want to come on your show tonight, your television show. And I want to be the guy who puts the stars in the sidewalks of Hollywood. So I did, and I said, and then, then ask me, um, how do you get your name in there? And kind of intimate that it's a, it's a money thing. And so I said, you know, he said, how do you get your name? I said, well, you have to have years of, of experience and, and years of uh, success. People have to know you. They have to be able to look at the star. And he said, well, I heard it was a matter of, of money. I said, what are you insinuating? And I just berated him. And, and he said, okay, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. I said, sorry doesn't do it. Why did you even have me on here? He said, okay. How would I get a name? And I said, do you have $10? And it, the audience laughed. You know, they got, so my joke worked. Now I... I go home, and the next day I'm at work, and my secretary says, uh, Bob, uh, Tommy Smothers is on the phone for you. I said, okay. And at this Hello. point, Tommy had had, uh, had had what kind of national exposure that you knew of as a, a musician, or had he had a show at that point? No, he already was on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. It already oh, the show was... For a year. Got it, okay. So I pick up the phone, I said, Tom? He said, yeah, Bob? I said, how you doing, pal? I said, listen, I'd love to talk to you, but my uncle's a hunchback and he's straightening up today, so I'll call you later. And I hung up. Because I was sure it was someone playing a joke. So then my secretary said, uh, he's back on the phone. I said, uh, hello? He said, Bob? Yeah, he said, Tom's mother. And I realized it was him. And I just, I got chills. I, I didn't know, because I didn't know what I did. Why is he calling me? And he said, I saw what you did last night, and I loved it. I'd like you to come over to CBS and talk to you about something. So now I'm going from not really caring about show business to going over to the Smothers, the Smothers Brothers show with no idea what he wants. So I sit there and watch uh, blocking, camera blocking for four hours. Tom, finally, Tommy comes over, and he says, Hey, man, I loved what you did. And he starts introducing me to everybody. And he says, um, I would like a job as a writer-performer on the Glenn Campbell Summer Show. And my mouth is open. I mean, I don't even know what's going on. So I said, uh, yeah, I can take that. I'll do that. Sure. He said, okay, I'm putting you with this kid, Steve Martin is his name, and uh, you'll be writing partners. I said, okay, thank you very much. He said, uh, I'll call you when we start. Now, I go back to work. I'm in a dreamland because I didn't care about this, and now I've got it, and I didn't, even, I didn't care about it. And I'm on, I forget cloud nine. I'm walking on the roof, and I don't hear from him for three months. So 
<laughs> I've gone from the apex to the toilet, and now I'm back writing advertising, and I get a call. Bob, yeah, Tom. Hi, Tom. He said, we start next week. I said, uh, what? I've been at this place for three and a half years. I, I think I've got to give them some time. He said, well, how much time do you need? I said, hang on. So that's the way it started. That's crazy. I mean, you hear stories crazy. about that. Crazy. You're basically it was, it was insane. out of nowhere. I mean, I had, the one good thing is when I wrote and produced and directed commercials, they were all comedy commercials, so they were one minute or 30 seconds. So if you wanted to be funny, you had a time limit, and you had an ending. You had a, I always believed in, in, in having an ending to, to a piece of comedy. So, so I had practiced and practiced, and then when I got over there, boy, I worked hard. Now how did you get the job at the ad agency? Was that right out of school? Yeah, that was how I started in the mailroom. And worked your way up to producing, directing. How long did that Writing take? Writing and producing, yeah. About a year. Wow. So do you think of yourself as a fairly ambitious guy, or were, were no, you just promoted no, up no, because of your no, talent? No, no, it just happened. It just it happened because um, I met a lot of people there that I really liked, and we got along, and they were in the creative department, and I would help add things and come up with ideas and things, so they finally moved me over. So your years of being funny at home paid off because you learned a lot about comedy and you're promoted quickly through the ad agency and then as soon as Tommy Smothers notices you, the piece you did on that show, he promotes you to this amazing position in comedy. I know, it's like a joke. It's like a joke because well, I didn't have the angst of, Jesus, I want to do this which is sometimes detrimental, you know? You, you, you so desperately want it um, that, that it sometimes can hurt. So, um, I don't know, it's just so lucky, I can't even think about it. But then, then when I got the chance, I really worked hard, so... It's funny that you mention that, because I do think, in order for a lot of comedy people to get into those treasured positions they do need to want it and there's a quality about you and your performing that for me has always set you apart in that you have this amazing calm about you and this like great straight man that that is unparalleled really uh by just about anybody in the last 30 years i can't think of somebody who can do the straight face and i wonder if that comes from the fact that you never cared you never wanted this you just sort of you're having fun and just sort of <laughs> fell into it um I, I don't i don't know you know i don't really know where it comes from i i have problems with people who are funny who analyze why they're funny or analyze why comedy is comedy. I, I feel that, that, that making people laugh is very intuitive and, and it, you, you seize the moment, you seize, what, you, you seize what is going on around that moment without thinking about all this crap and something comes up. I think I, mean, I, I I've I've dealt with a lot of of comedy writers and people in my day who regurgitate things that are obviously not from their soul. They're just they're just practiced, and because of all the years of watching comedy and doing, they they've developed a style of being able to do that. I know that about you, and I I like that. I think a lot of comedians, comedy writers from your generation especially have this feeling of, you know, don't deconstruct the comedy, just do the comedy, and it's not even something you consciously think about. It's just you like to do the comedy, it's fun, the audience likes it. As soon as you start deconstructing it or explaining why it's funny, it's like the dissecting the frog analogy. As soon as you dissect it, it's not funny. It really is. It really is. And, and the one thing I was able to do is I was able to do the talk shows in those days, uh, both as my character, Super Dave, and I, as a kid, I worked with Steve Allen. I mean, that was a, 
business, but to being able to do the Tonight Show and Letterman and those shows, especially the Tonight Show. But um, what it did is it 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 proved to myself that I knew what I was doing because if you go out there and make an audience laugh, then what you're doing is obviously working. So other performers see that, so they, when they come to do your show, they have trust in you. And and the, 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 at that time, the talk shows Johnny Carson was so huge that and important that if you did well, you know, the next day you really had a lot of offers. Yeah, you're on top of the world for a bit. Yeah. Uh, well, I appreciate you uh, talking to me and doing this show because obviously what we do here is deconstruct humor. But there's a thing in the younger generation of comedy, and I think here's an analogy. It's like DVD commentaries. Steven Spielberg doesn't do DVD commentaries because he just wants to make these great movies that affect you emotionally, and that's it. He doesn't want to explain it. But now besides commentaries, they have blogs and podcasts that overanalyze everything and they really want to dig in and find out how things tick why do you suppose that is a thing generationally and i'm nowadays comedians comedy writers anybody in the entertainment industry is happy to dive deep into their work and how they do it in a way that previous generation of comedians just aren't interested in um I think that the electronic generation has just drastically changed the way we do everything. I mean, there are so many positives to it and so many negatives. I personally cannot stand when I go out to dinner seeing these people on their phones just staring at them. And that's what they do. And, and they're sending the tweets and sending the texts and all this stuff. You, we didn't do that. We didn't. If you wanted to talk to someone, you picked up the phone and called them. I mean, the, the, to share ideas with people is just—it's—it's—it's it's, it's people you don't know or people you know. It, it's very unusual to me. It's just—it's just unusual to me, and it's become—it's uh, just taken over the world, and now. Look at the shows on television now. Look at look at what look at the money that the Kardashians have made. It's astounding. It's astounding. The Gabors were more talented than the. I mean, I don't know what the Kardashians do. I haven't been able to figure that out exactly. They're on TV, I guess. They're on TV, and that mother runs the show. And now, because again of this generation. You know, the news used to carry what was going on. Now the news is so secondary because you look at your phone and you've got what's going on. And, and, and so Caitlyn Jenner, Bruce Jenner, you know, the, the, the great-looking decathlon champion becomes a woman. Not a bad-looking woman, but it would have been better if she were younger. But becomes a woman, and that lasts for 10 minutes. Then a kid shoots up uh, a church. Then two prisoners escape, and the only one they ca caught were the people that worked at the prison. And, I mean, it's just thing after thing after thing. It's a very strange world we live in today. Don't you feel that? Absolutely. It's the infotainmentization of news. Yeah, that happened exactly. I think, in the 1980s when they when Reagan got rid of the fairness doctrine. You didn't have to have balance on TV. So now the news department was in the same boat as the the other departments. They had to produce programming that got ratings. And so now we've got news that generates excitement and alarm and keeps you watching. So you'll watch the ads and there's no almost no news that's just news about information about what actually happened that's important. I know, I know. But, I mean, I'm, I'm really bringing your comedy show into the toilet down, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about news now, somehow. <laughs> we're into death news, but let's <laughs> get into ISIS while we're here. Uh, but to pick up on that, there's, there's an element of, 
the serious that works in comedy because you need contrast and that's one thing you're always very good at is bringing the serious the balance of that I think is something a lot of people don't get right they have too much of the silly and not enough of the serious something that we struggled with at the onion a lot we in the early days it was always about less jokes less jokes it's too funny we have to make it more serious because it's that serious anchor the straight man like the guy explaining how you can't but what are you insinuating to buy a, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame you spent a lot of time doing that you spent right. a tiny fraction of the time doing the punchline and same right. with Super Dave he's spending a lot of time seriously explaining you know how he prepared for this and how, how oh, exactly. important this is exactly and, and, and the, what I always went for in comedy is the ending I knew if I had a great ending to a piece of comedy then I could back up and make it funny there. Some some people believe the other thing, that you just go funny, and if you don't have an ending, it doesn't matter. But I, I believe the other way. And I, I believe that people who, who want to be in the comedy business should really follow it, do it, try it. Because if you don't, you just waste, you, you just waste a chance. And there's you just so many. No, you never know what can happen. So, you know, there are comedy clubs. There's improv groups. There's there's so many ways, and and you can be discovered. You can be discovered, and 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 if you don't try it and don't do it, then you're really letting yourself down. I'm not saying don't work, don't work at a at a at a, at a restaurant or something, but don't don't give up your dream. I I, I just think it's crazy. If enough people say, hey, give up your dream, give it up, because <laughs> the audience isn't laughing. But, but you know, I, especially growing up, if you grew up and you were making people laugh and you were enjoying it and stuff, don't, don't throw that away. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, they go into it because they have some emotional hole to fill, but there are plenty who pursue it just because it's fun and they like to do it and they see it as a real job prospect for them. Have you encountered more of the former or the latter in, in your uh, long career? Um, you encounter everybody. You know, sometimes you don't know, uh, but but there uh, again, there are a lot of people who are formula people, and and when you meet them, you, I personally, it's kind of a turnoff because I I know I'm not going to get anything, um, I, I'm not going to get anything new or innovative or anything out of that, but but working in comedy all these years, you just. As you're doing your show, you also experience outside events that make you laugh so hard you can't stand it. I produced 18 hours of Red Fox Variety Show, and I've got seven hours of stories about that. I mean, he was the greatest. He was the funniest, but he was also stoned 24 hours a day. Yeah. But I loved him. I loved him because he, when he performed, he performed. It didn't matter. But, I mean, I'll give you one story that just is, to me, it's the funniest of all time. He would, he would do coke and grass, and, and he loved sex. So that's basically his days, and I would, when I rehearsed with him, the rehearsals were kind of short, because he would get it right away, and he wasn't that interested in it, but, but when he performed, it was perfect. The first show, we've got 400 people in the audience, and we have... Uh, a giant set, R E D D, and it turns into a tenement. Bands playing because, uh, and then Red's supposed to come out the door. No Red. We do it again. No Red. I stop tape. I go to his dressing room. I knock on the door. I hear what? I said. I open the door. Now the girl who's doing his makeup and hair is sitting on his him. So I see her, and he's under her dress. And I said, Red. And from under the dress, he said, What? I said, We're on camera. He said, Can't a man relax? Uh, the, the level of characters that you got in comedy, I feel like, was just more extreme 
uh, early on. Like now, I think because the field is so competitive, the people who succeed are not only talented, they're also together and they're clean and they're emotionally stable. But I feel like earlier on, you could have crazy people succeeding wildly. Yes. In the years that I was doing the Smothers and in the 70s, I mean, everyone was doing drugs, including the network people. You know, so you'd have people up and down and up and down and up and down. But but a lot of people couldn't perform without doing drugs. Yeah. Did you help Red Fox uh, get Sanford and Son going? No. Uh, my, the show I did was after Sanford and Son. Oh, his variety uh, show was ABC after. He got him away from Sanford and Son to do this variety show. Okay. And he was... He was just a great man. I mean, I, he helped so many people. You can't believe it. Gave young writers a chance, and well, he gave everybody a chance. He'd give his friends a chance. I mean, it's it's just, and then no one helped him when he needed it. But I loved him, and then I also did a variety show with Dick Van Dyke, who was you know just a legend. Yep. We were able to do the first series in the history of cable, which was bizarre with John Biner. Bizarre. John yep. Biner. And, and that's where I started doing Super Dave, and then we did Super Dave. That was on uh, what? Showtime. Eight? Showtime, okay. Yeah. A lot of people discovered you as, in my generation anyway, discovered you as Super Dave. Yeah. Because we were yeah. too young to see you as Officer Judy yeah. <laughs> on the Smothers yeah. Brothers. But... Yeah. Uh, Super Dave was a great spoof on Evil Knievel, whose time had come and gone. Actually, actually, people thought that, but it wasn't. Well, that's what I thought. Okay, what it was is it was a it was a takeoff on everybody in Hollywood who, when they were interviewed, would say, "I love doing this movie. I loved working with them. The director was great." And then when the camera was off, they would unload. So I wanted a, a kind of a personality who was full of himself, but when he got hurt, <laughs> you got the real message out there. Right. But, uh, so that's basically where it came. The fact that I did stunts allowed me to do physical comedy, which I loved. I, I mean, I just, if you do a great physical comedic stunt or a great physical comedic move, it makes people laugh from the gut. I agree. That's it's nothing more powerful. No. But you do. Used... I love doing that. Was Peter Sellers? I just shot in the dark. Killed me. It just killed me. Yeah. Did you put yourself in harm's way ever? Because it seemed to me like you were always oh, using yeah. dummies. Oh uh, yeah. I broke my... <laughs> once, once I, I pulled up. You know, I, I would always come up on some vehicle and almost run over Mike. And, and I come up on this motorcycle, and I realize oh, I'm going too fast, so I put my heel down to help stop the bike, and I'm, I'm in pain like you can't believe it. I'm rolling around the ground, and everybody is roaring laughing, because they think I'm hamming it up. But I broke my heel. Oof. Yeah. Yeah, I hurt myself a few times, and, and we had this... Uh, we had this special effects guy. We did the show in Canada. My partner was Canadian because of finances. And we were, we, our, our Bizarre and Super Dave were, were on uh, a regular Canadian television and Showtime. So it had to make it in both markets. And the Showtime wanted nudity and swearing because they just wanted that kind of a show. Right. And th th I couldn't do that in Canada, so we had to shoot the show two ways. But we had a special effects guy for Super Dave who was a Canadian, and he wore a doctor suit, uh, a smock, like he was a doctor of uh, special effects. And everything he did was a little off. And so we're doing a thing where I'm opening up the 18th hole of my golf course, because I only owned a golf course with 17 holes. I could never get the land on the 18th, so we could never have tournaments there. So now I'm putting on the green of the 18th hole, and I say to Fuji, why did it take us so long to get this land? He said, oh, sacred Indian burial ground. I said, oh, and the Indians didn't mind? He went, no, and I get an arrow in the ass. 
And we pan up, and there's an Indian on the hill dressed in golf clothes on a horse with a, a, a quiver bag with golf clubs in it. So I say to the special effects guy, how are we going to do this? And he said, what we're going to do is build a special uh, form of, of a, a thing to put in your butt, and then I'm going to slingshot a razor arrow on a filament into that unit, and it'll look just like it goes into your ass. Now, I am saying to myself, God Almighty, is this going to hurt? Because I know him. So we get ready, we do it. I can hear the razor arrow coming on the line. It goes right through the protection into my ass. Uh. Yeah, oh, it's not even close to what I was feeling. And I'm only going to do this once because I'm not going to take the chance of happening again. So now what I'm supposed to do is fall down in pain, which I, which I had no trouble doing. But before I did, I looked at the special effects guy standing there in his doctor's uniform. And he gives me the palms up. Eh, like you win a few, you lose a few. <laughs> so I got hurt. I got hurt a lot. But it was the most fun that anyone could ever have. It was like going to comedy camp. Sure. Was he ever on camera? Because the doctors rushing to Super Dave's aid was always no, funny. No, 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 no. He wasn't a doctor. No, I know, but he, he, looked, he, he looked like no, one. No, 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 no. I'll tell you another great story. First Super Dave show. Uh, we had come off 12, uh, six years of Bizarre, 25 shows a year, and we were a big hit. So I had to do something, not only a stunt, but I had to do something very special for that first Super Dave show. So I said to my partner, look, I got nothing to lose. I'm going to call my favorite human being in the world and see what happens. So I call up Ray Charles, and I talked to his manager, and I said, uh, my name's Bob Einstein. I play a character named Super Dave. And he says, yeah, we know who you are. I said, oh, thank you very much. I hope you like it. Yeah, we like it, yeah. And so I said, um, I, I'm going to ask for something you can hang up, but I just, my dream would be to have Ray Charles, who is the greatest single entertainer in the world, do what did I say on my, sh my first show. He said, I'll get back to you. So I figure, okay, I tried. Three days later, I get a call. He said, uh, Bob, yeah. He said, Joe. I said, hi, Joe. He said, all right, Ray's going to do it under one condition. I said, what's that? You let him do a stunt with you. <laughs> and I, I, I just went, oh, yeah, I don't, I mean, I mean, that's a dream. That's gold. That's, that's a dream. I wouldn't ask that. So beautiful. every year for six years, he did my first show. And we would do a stunt with him. That's so great. I'm glad you asked him. Oh, so am I. So am I. So, are you paying for some of those injuries now as you're getting older? No, no, actually, no. You're I, all right? You know, I played college basketball, too, and I, I mean, I, I, I feel pretty good. That's great. A lot of people... Yeah, it's great. It is great. I was lucky. <laughs> there were so many times where everything was so close. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know Chevy Chase is uh, in a lot of pain from all those falls he did on SNL. Yeah, that was, that was tough to do all that. You know, if you're 6'4", like we were, that's, that's, a, that's not easy to do. Yeah. You know, and, and he would go completely down. Well, you think you can do it in your 20s and never pay for it, and then... But you do. You do. You sure do. Look at all these athletes. Look at these guys who played pro sports. They're all limping around. Yeah, they really punish them. Yeah. Let me ask you this. You wrote a book way back that I discovered when I was a teenager and I thought it was so funny. This is my first, this is my first magic book. Boy, that's so nice of you to be that kind of a fan. Oh no, believe me, I you were there was something special about your comedy for me as a oh, kid. So I nice. I stayed up late to watch David Letterman's show and I discovered you on that show and you, like I said, you were the sort of straight man. Like the the only other person who had that straight man caliber was Leslie Nielsen, who did great on the Police Squad show. Yeah, Leslie Nielsen was great. Yeah, and 
he had come from being a serious actor, and you, however, had come from comedy. Right. But you still had that sense of this is you have to be so serious in order to sell the comedy, in a way that m so many other comedians just weren't hitting. They just weren't hitting that. And one of the things I appreciated about that book was your love and embrace of incompetence, which I've always thought was funny. Incompetence is funny, especially when the person is a total blowhard and thinks they're the greatest. I know, and a magician. A magician. A book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so stupid. It's yeah. so stupid. But stupid in such a great way. No, I know. I such know. Such a great I, way. I loved it. It's like Super, Super Dave is very similar. It's like, I yeah, know, they're a bunch of I stupid know. stunts, but they're so well I contextualized. Know, you know what? You know what? They have to look good, because if they're just pure stupid and the stunts don't make you laugh, then, you, then you're gone. Well, yeah, and that's, uh, it's interesting you didn't mention, like, the Three Stooges. You liked Laurel and Hardy, and you liked Martin and Lewis. Martin was a great straight man for Lewis, and... Martin was a great talent. Period. He was, yeah, I mean, a great singer, you know, a great when everything. He, when he split up with that maniac i mean he just soared he was a good man too he was a good man and he was funny yeah but jerry lewis was brilliant when he was younger you know he was just brilliant but and the combination of the two just was so special i always felt i wasn't in in love with the three stooges because there was too much going on there I, I I don't know what it was. I'm not going to try to say why I wasn't in love. I liked them, but I wasn't in love with them. I, and now I don't know why, but it, that's just the fact. Yeah, I mean, maybe I never gave them a chance, but it just always seemed like it was all a bunch of slapstick physically humor without the context. Laurel and Hardy had it the, really seemed that without the yeah, relationship. Without the, and Laurel and Hardy yeah, had this great relationship with these villains. They weren't villains. They were just like rich people who were full of themselves, who Laurel and Hardy would uh, embarrass or, or get full of eggs or, you know, whatever. Th they were the straight man to those guys. What I loved about Laurel and Hardy, and I don't want to be, uh, you know, repeat myself, but... The relationship. You they mentioned. had a love relationship. And Hardy was a gentleman. And Laurel was, you know, he was in that suit. Hardy had a great harumph that he would do at the camera. It wound up being his signature. Yep, right, right, right. When he would get fed up. Yep. And the way they got that is Hardy loved to play golf. So they were filming one day, and Hardy said, I've got to go. And Laurel said, I need another take. He said, no, one more, one more. And, and the final take... Hardy did that harumph to the camera, like, let me go, and that became a signature. That's great. And then with uh, Martin and Lewis, you know, Lewis obviously by himself is, is just a cr crazy, uh, wacky, funny face guy, funny voices guy. But, but with boy, was he funny with, with, I mean, physically funny. Right. And faces and attitude. And, I mean, he was Martin's crazy kid. That's right. That's what it was. And he, you know. He was like the Jim Carrey of his era. Yeah. So what are you working on now, Bob? Are you doing any more Super Dave, or is that behind you? Or what, what uh, have we got cooking? I don't think I'll do any more Super Dave. I, I did, uh, like, six years ago, I did... Uh, Four, four or six of them for Spike TV, and when you go away from something and then you come back, you you just, even though it's the most fun you've ever had in your life, it, it's hard. <laughs> you know, the, the, you got to do all the work again, and it's hard, so... Yeah, and don't you uh, get bored of it, too? Don't you want to do a new character and come well, up Well, I did, uh, you know, I did Curb Your Enthusiasm for seven years. Loved seeing you on that. You were great. Oh, thanks. And then uh, I haven't seen this. I, there's no clips online, and obviously there's too many shows to watch all the shows, but I'm delighted to know that you're showing up on Comedy Bang Bang uh, as this Harvey Wrinkleman character. Yeah, I guess. That's great. Tell us about that. Well, it was just a, it was a fun day. I mean, you know, I just played this old comic character. You're not going to... out of his mind. That's awesome. Are you going to bring that guy back? No. <laughs> okay. No. Will you try other characters on that show? I don't know. I mean, that was just a fun day. I had a great time. Yeah, you got to have some fun. Yeah. 
So anything else in the in the works? You're not going to do another book. You gave up publishing in the 70s with the... Really <laughs> this did. is my first magic book. I really did. There's no... Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I, people have been after me for years to write a book about what I've experienced, but... I don't know. I just don't... But to sit down and do that is so egotistical to me that... that I mean, if I could do it without saying that it's me and just, just write down all the experiences I've had because they've been phenomenal. Maybe you could write a fictional biography of Super Dave. Yeah. That'd be fun. Yes. Well, Bob, it's been great talking to you. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you very much, and I hope we were funny enough. Well, the goal of the show is more informational than entertainment or, or comedy. Well, I'll end it with a joke then. Let's All right. end it with a joke so we know we have to <laughs> You always want to end. You want to end with something funny. A 10-year-old's walking down the hallway of his house. He hears screaming in his parents' bedroom. He opens the door. There's his father dressed in a uh, uh, balloon hat and, and swim fins, nothing else. His mother's wearing an Oprah wig and bunny shoes, and they're going at it. They're having some fun. And he said, Daddy, what's going on? He said, oh, nothing, sweetheart. We're just having a little fun. Go to bed. I'll tuck you in in 20 minutes. 20 minutes later, the father's trudging down the hall. He's screaming in the kid's bedroom. He opens up the door. His kid's having sex with his grandmother. He said, Billy, what the hell are you doing? He said, it's not so funny when it's your mother, is it? Thanks for listening to the How to Write Funny podcast. For more resources to help your comedy writing, visit howtowritefunny.com.